Guys, like I said a while ago, a lot of these faces are people I see every year. It's like connecting with old friends. I'm glad you all came out. Um, a lot of them are now my hunting buddies, so I'll just uh, tell you, two years ago I stood right here and I said, I don't hunt with very many people. I'm picky, blah, blah, blah. I'm with my son, I'm with this other guy. And what this seminar is going to be about today is proving me wrong because in 2012 I talked about how much of a solo backcountry artist I am. And now this whole side of the room over here now become my friends and I pretty much hunted with them all in August of this year. And so I, uh, a lot of doors have opened for me through these seminars talking to guys. As you know, this, is, this seminar today is going to be about thinking outside the box, coming up with other ideas, how to get mule deer tags. I'm a passionate mule deer hunter, I'm a bow hunter, and mule deer, are my, that's my deal. That's what I love to do the most. And our um, opportunity to do that is shrinking all the time. Even though the Mule Deer Foundation, Sportsman for Wildlife, these shows, there's a lot of folks out there working really hard to ensure that we all have this opportunity that we love to do. And if you love mule deer, I'm assuming that's why you're here. Uh, but it's, it's not an alarming rate. It's not like all of the bow hunting opportunity for mule deer is going away so fast that you know we're not gonna have it 10 years. But what I'm saying is 10 years ago, there were tags in Colorado that I would get that to, uh, as a second choice. There are some tags in Colorado five years ago that I would get as a third choice. And today, those tags are, you're lucky if you get it on a second choice. Some of the tags I used to get as a first choice, uh, I wouldn't bank points, but I would put in for it, get the tag, and I could go every year. There are years now that I can't even get those tags. So as this whole entire era that we live in now of backcountry hunting, this whole do it yourself. It's, you know, we've been doing it since we were cavemen, but the Eastman family came along and really introduced us to that stuff in their magazine in the 80s. And then Cameron Haynes came along and he started editing for Eastman's Bow Hunting in, in the late 90s, early 2000. And a lot of us gravitated to that. And then there's just a whole bunch of do-it-yourself guys now, and now there are teams upon teams upon teams of guys doing videos, online magazines, all of this stuff about earning it and doing it yourself. And that is wonderful for our sport because we're growing our sport. But as you grow the sport, there are only so many resources. Mule deer aren't on the upswing right now. We're not growing new ones all the time. We're not getting more and more hunting opportunity, but there are less and less opportunity to do what we love with more and more people doing it. So for me, I take that, I take that pretty seriously because since 1994, there has not, that's when I moved out west and discovered mule deer and mule deer bow hunting. And since 1994, not one season has gone by that I've not had at least one to up to multiple four or five different state mule deer tags in my pocket. And um, I, I would hate to ever think that there'd be a September that I can't get out and do that. But I, I'm sure someday down the road it, it will be. Um, for example, on, I live in the Four Corners area, New Mexico, back in from 1994, end of 94 into 2000. And I hunted all four states. I hunt Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. I didn't really hunt Arizona, but I did hunt on the Navajo, the Navajo uh, reservation. That was the best kept secret forever. And there, we would back then. It was 150 bucks, and your tags were left over. We'd go buy them if we didn't hunt anywhere else. And they had great bucks on the Navajo. It's public land; you can do it. Now, what used to be leftover, dozens of tags that we would go get if we didn't have anything else. You have to be in person on the day they sell them, and there's three tags for non-Navajos in each of those units that we love to hunt in. That was my absolute favorite place to hunt on the planet Earth. And as that, as that, I watched slowly as that opportunity went away, they have managed their deer herd tremendously. They have some astounding bucks coming off the Navajo Indian Reservation now. And I understand the tags are harder to get. They had to really limit it because it used to be they were more cultured around hunt opportunity for families. That's what, and, and that their whole culture is that way. It's not about trophy hunting, right? Now they 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 will cater to us. You know the non Navajos that want to go hunt there for trophy bucks. So those guys year in year out they get their tags. They kill meat bucks and it's their culture and I respect it the highest. I love those guys. But as it as they try to increase, they they've changed the way they do things now. They increase the herd quality. 
and the size of the bunks. They have management hunts and all that. So what well, used to be a fling fest for all of us when we were younger, we take our, and my buddies, the Duggars, they take their nephews, we put around in our pickup trucks, the Toyotas, on the two-track logging roads and watch the kids jump out with their bows and fling at forking horns all day long. That, I love that. I mean, I, I would love to just sit and be like, I'll kill a big buck at the end of the season, but I'm going to watch all these kids kill their bucks. And it's so fun. You know, that's the funnest part of hunting for me was watching them do that. And now it's sad for me because we don't get to really do that anymore. So now I'm trying. I have three grandkids now. So I'm thinking ahead. You know, they're only one, there's one, two, and four. And I'm already thinking about how I'm going to start making their points for when they, where do I want to be with them when they get older. So anyway, kind of on a tangent there. Um, in the past, my seminars, I'm very structured. And I have this thing here, and I'm like, we do this, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. That's a good plan. When I go to the next slide, we do it again. I don't want to do that today. I have some slides put up here, but I want to talk to you guys about some ideas. I want to take like the first 35, 40 minutes, talk about what I want to talk about. If it, it provokes any thought, anything you want to talk about, I, ask me questions. Because my seminars are always, I want to give you the very best of what I've got. I want to give you all of the information, the best pictures, the best slides, and, and give you so much information that at the end, there's usually not enough time to really talk about what we just talked about. And then for anybody who gets questions, I got some Hoyt swag, I got some, this is my brand, Muley Slayer. If you go to Facebook, uh, you can just go to Facebook Muley Slayer. That is my page, that's where I connect with everybody. So after this, when we go on there, like the page, I interact and talk bow hunting mule deer with everybody all the time. But I have a couple shirts, Muley Slayer shirts to give away. I got some Hoyt swag. So, so real quick, for those of you who don't know me, I'm on Hoyt's Factory Hunting Pro Staff. I've uh, been with those guys since 1998, as, long, as well as a few other industry partners. I don't really like to call them sponsors because I've been with them so long, they're like family. They're just, they're just partners now. So Gold Tip, Interlock Broadheads now is a new partner with me, and, uh, and of course Hoyt. So that being said, um, is this supposed to go to the, does this have an on off button to advance to the next slide? And I'm having technical difficulty today. <laughs> Does that do it? Just at the I just moved by myself. Okay. Well, even better. <laughs> yeah. Well, my computer is a data design. I'm only I think right there. So, anybody recognize those? If you could go advance that, that'd be great, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, like I said, I uh, lived in Colorado for about 15 years. That's where I really got into the do-it-yourself, high country, backpack type of hunting, right? As my opportunity started to dwindle in Colorado, I started looking outside my box. I started looking at other opportunities. Now, New Mexico has excellent late season archery hunts. They have late season, is it working now? Yeah. Okay, they have late season archery hunts. And that's where, I, I do put in for rifle hunts, and I'll put in for muzzleloader hunts, just to have one in my arsenal, you know, every once in a while I'll get the itch to break out some Usually what will happen, if you watched any trends of mine, I'll have a really <laughs> poor archery season. And then that will happen about every three or four years. I'll be like, oh, man, I had a bad season. I need to kill something tiny or I didn't get anything. And then uh, the next year it will be like, oh, man, Mark drew another rifle tag. Huh? How funny that followed that trend of not killing it. But uh, I've pounded a lot. I've pounded more than my share of deer with a bow and arrow. But every once in a while, one of my buddies, or, or I'll just get the itch to be like, man, I just need to break out some horsepower and go knock one down. But... When I started looking outside of my box in Colorado, Utah was a place that has always attracted me. There's always dandy bucks and great opportunity here. And you guys about four years ago made the decision, the state made the decision, I think, was it four or five years ago to go to breaking your units down to a draw. And a lot of people wigged out. As a non-resident that does not live here, that comes and visits the state, 
the areas that I've hunted in the past to now are better. It has made a difference. And you know, I was like, well, wow, this guy from not from here is, has an opinion. Well, I do pay to come here, and I love Utah, and I love the people of Utah. But my favorite state is new. It's my new favorite hunting destination, and this show is my favorite show. Connecting with you guys has always been one of my best shows all year long. And so I love to meet the people. I love to come out here and hunt. But your opportunity is one that's really. I've seen it on the ground, what they're doing with the wildlife. I've seen more, the moose especially, oh my gosh. So anyway, I was flying over yesterday, I took this picture, and I was like, man, that's the Wasatch, and I killed my buck somewhere, is this a pointer on here? Somewhere over in this area. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I was flying over, and I could see some peaks, and I was like, man, but yeah, we're right in there somewhere. That's where I killed it. But I, I, I love the Wasatch. It's awesome looking, but what's different about the Wasatch in Colorado is you get on a ridge in Colorado, and I've said this before, and you can go, and you start walking, and you can end up in Utah, or you can end up in Wyoming if you stay up on the ridges, and you may not ever hit a road or see a town. And about in here in Utah, what's different is you go over this one, there's a road. You go over this one, there's, you know, it's just, they're straight up and straight down, and you don't get as far in as you could say in Wyoming, or, so there's ways to hunt that, and I, I came out here for three or four years, and I got skunked um, on the general tag. It, well, there's a couple of tags. I came and hunted uh, down south by uh, Monticello, back when you could get those tags. Really. That's right before you went to the breaking up the units and all that. No points or anything. I just put in. Went down by Monticello, saw some giant bucks, didn't get one. <coughs> Saved my tag, came back for the extended hunt. How many of you guys hunt the extended hunt? Man, everybody loves extended hunt, man. I, by the end, if there's snow, I'm done, man. I, 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 got, I lived in Colorado all those years. I'm back in Texas now, and I love warm weather. And if there's snow on the ground, there's probably other things for me to be doing. So, I, or, or gun hunting. But, but bow hunting in the snow, man, is, is so tough. And I have the highest, highest level of uh, respect for any of you guys that kill on extended hunt, on that late hunt, and, and even, even two points. If you kill a nice working horn on that hunt, man, you've really done something. So, you should be... I, I, I came and I hunted it and I hunted it really hard and I struggled the whole time. One of the things I struggled with was the amount of people, okay? <laughs> because every single person, if you couldn't see, raise your hand. You all love the extended. How many of you guys hunted in August? <laughs> a little more, about half of the people said they hunted in August. They get the tag and they wait for the extended and they do it. So that's something to think about too. Um, but I finally, this year, um, I came out and I had a two week adventure. And this was me looking outside my box. I met uh, the guys over here. Uh, stand up real quick. Team Backcountry, stand up. These are local guys that live here. All members right here. It's Corey, Dustin, and Jason. If you don't know these guys, get to know these guys. Find them on Facebook. Go find their, go like their page. Go find them on YouTube or Vimeo. They, that's who built that nice video for me uh, that we played at the beginning of this deal. They are the consummate do-it-yourselfers. Good dudes. Kill nice animals all about helping each other. They approached me after one of these shows and, hey, we'd like to hunt with you someday. And we've become really great friends. But what I did was I didn't draw a tag in Colorado, so I had to make a point. I used three points to draw my Utah tag because I knew I was going to get the tag here on the general hunt. I mean, I don't even know if it took any points, but I decided I wanted to hunt it with the Wasatch, and I wanted to kill a buck in August on that hunt because people say it's really tough and I like a challenge. And I had my butt whooped a bunch of times out here, and I prefer to hunt August. So I got a Utah tag, and then those boneheads talked me into putting in for Nevada with them. I'm like, okay. So I drew a Nevada tag, and it was a pretty awesome tag. I think we got him a second choice. Now, out of respect for my brothers at Back Team Backcountry, I can't tell you where we went, but if you go do your research, and if you watch Facebook at all, you'll know where the heck we went and look at the pictures. But opportunity I didn't know about, but they said, hey, pretty good chance we're going to get a tag on the second choice. Just put in for us, put in with us and go. Saw some tremendous bucks, okay? But I, and I never had any real opportunity to shoot a really big buck, but I did whack this three point there. And um, so what happens is I fly into Salt Lake, we all get in the car, and we all go to Nevada. And we backpack in 11 miles. And I've been working at a desk in Texas for a year since I've been out west. <laughs> I was like, oh man, so. I, you know, 
out of respect for these guys, I have to tell you, they might have carried some of my stuff. <laughs> they might have put my spotting scope, but they might have put some of my stuff in there. Because they're like, dude, we love you, but we want to get there today. <laughs> hey, I know, man. So anyway, am I right? Am I lying? Corey, right? He's a beast, man. He is, he is the epitome of beast mode. So he, he could help me get in there. And uh, we whacked that buck, got it out, got back to Utah. And here's something I'll tell you. It goes into the next part of uh, what some of the things we're talking about. So, like, what is your goal? Exploring new areas, trophy class animals. Maybe you just want to meet new hunting partners, right? Or you're just looking for adventure. Or maybe all three. I did. I did all this stuff. Uh, I wasn't really care. I didn't really care about trophy aspect. The more you get to know me, the more you realize that's that's pretty low in the totem pole of priority for me. I want it to be nice. I want it to at least be three years old, four year old buck. I don't, you know. Save the fork and horn for the youngsters, the guys getting into hunting. But but for me, I don't have to shoot a Boone and Crockett deer. I don't even have to shoot a Pope and Young deer. That is not either one of those are Pope and Young deer. But I do have to put meat in my freezer. And these bugs have probably escaped a guy or two. So you know what? I'm I'm happy with shooting this 24 inch three point. And this thing here, look at that. I mean, who wouldn't shoot that? You, I saw that buck and I was like, you are good as dead, man. I'm taking, I'm taking you back to Texas with me. So, and that's the kind of guy I am. So if you're in here trying to get Boone and Crockett information, you need to talk to David Long. I'm not that guy. I love David, but I'm a, I like bloody arrows and I like them just, and I, like old Cam told me one time, I said, are you truly a trophy hunter? He's like, no, if I can make it look good in a picture, I'm going to kill it. <laughs> so, I, I like it. That works for me too, man. If it look good in a picture, I'll kill it. So, and uh, so I came out to Utah, we go over to Nevada, me and those guys, we whack and stack, we all, I shoot this buck, Jason shoots a 175 inch buck, we're 12 miles in, I come back, and I had a pretty good plan, I was going to hunt with this guy, and go hunt in his camp, in an area, I'm going to say this, I got there, the guy wasn't who I thought he was, awesome human being, great guy, our styles don't jive, the way we hunt, our hunting experience is much different. And rather than set and be a victim of circumstance, I had what's called a backup plan. I didn't even know I had a backup plan. My cane sitting right here. So I get to this camp, and I'm hunting with this guy, things aren't working out. He's an awesome guy, but it's just, I'm like, I, there's no way I can stay here and hunt here. There's two, we're in an area, there's people everywhere, two or three deer, people everywhere. We don't really jive. And I said, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to be a victim of my circumstance. i got to have a backup plan. And Mike Hanks looked at me at the end of day two and says, dude, we got to get you up this mountain. You've got to leave. We, you, this is not for you. I can tell. you got to do something different. So I want to give him some credit. This guy runs me off of the mountain. I get a shower. I repack my pack. One of my buddies drives me back up said canyon, back in the Wasatch somewhere, and drops me off on the side of the highway. And I said, pick me up here Friday. I'm just going to go explore the country. I'm just going to go. I got my phone, I'm gonna turn it off, put it on, you know, airplane mode if I have to, but you have great service in the Wasatch, anywhere up in there, you have great service, so you're not too far back. And you can pretty much limp down to the highway if anything happens to you. So, not to diminish that experience, because the Wasatch Mountains are now one of my absolute favorite hunting destinations. I love them. But again, I put it for that same unit again, and it's right here, Wasatch West. I put it for the tag again, but I met this guy, I liked him, and I, I, I asked you guys to do the same thing. Start, you know, if you're watching Facebook, everybody's on Facebook, right? Is, if you're on Facebook, raise your hand. Okay, we're all on Facebook. At least the adults are. Here's the deal, don't be a hater. If you see my tiny bucks, like my bucks, man. If you kill a giant buck, I'm gonna like your buck. And what happens is you start liking each other's stuff. And this is true stuff, man. This is like, everybody takes it for granted that Facebook is, Facebook is a very powerful tool right now. I wouldn't know half the people in this room if it wasn't for Facebook. But I start liking people's stuff. And I start asking questions. A bit of a stalker. Don't don't be a you know you don't have to be an absolute stalker. But go like their pictures. Look at the terrain. And if the guy seems like hey man he's a pretty nice guy, you can hit him up. And say hey I was out your way hunting whatever and I was thinking about putting in for some stuff. What do you know? And if you live in a mule deer rich state you're probably going to get some reciprocity because you're going to, hey, you tell me, I'm going to tell you. Every single person that has taken me, I've offered something back. I'll give up one of my spots in Colorado. I'll give up one of my spots on the Navajo. I'll give up one of my spots if you're willing to give up one of your spots. And so that, that, that is really great networking. 
You can use it. You can stalk on. You can stalk on Instagram, Facebook, any of those. But you look at the bucks, and you can get. And so I did that. And the guy reached out to me and said, "I'd love to take you hunting." And I was all for it. And I went with the guy, and I hunted with him in his camp, and it just didn't work out. And luckily, Mike Tanks. I knew him. I met him. I met him last year, actually here. And uh, he's got a brand, Wasatch Boy, and he's a really cool dude. He got me off the mountain, killed the buck, and it was all about. It was all about resourcing with other people. So when we go back to this, what is the goal? Exploring new areas, trophy class animals, meet new hunting partners. Might, meeting new hunting partners might be down the list, but the point of that is, are you going to, you can do some stuff, some back and forth, right? I'm gonna trade with you and you're gonna, and you get to know good people. In my case, I've met some people I don't absolutely jive with, but I've met some folks that I absolutely are now like family to me. So. Um, one thing I'm gonna go over real quick, exploring new areas, and this is part of the slide, but the slide is important. Regardless of where you decide to go on, don't think, well, I live in Utah, and maybe the mule deer in Alberta are different. No, a mule deer is a mule deer is a mule deer, wherever he lives. They have their own ways about them. That they're gonna, they, the one thing you wanna do is, I tell everybody that's hunted mule deer at all, you, the only thing you need to concern yourself with is the wind, always. Get above them, stay above them, and keep the wind in your favor always. Because I've known a lot of guys have a lot of questions at seminars. Where do I camp? I don't. Now, if you're hunting in Alberta, obviously you're Kansas or in a plain state for mule deer. You're going to hunt that totally different. But once you're out on the stalk, the number one thing that you've always got to consider is the wind. Always, no matter what. Mature mule deer bucks, they can. That, I, they'll see you. They can even hear you, and you may get away with some shenanigans. But if even a hint of your scent gets to them. It's over, and it's over probably for good, at least for days on end. And if you've packed, backpacked into a high mountain basin, and you blow them out, and either they go over the, the basin into another, another canyon, at the minimum, you're gonna have to hike out, go all the way around to find them again, but like in some of my circumstances in Colorado, where I hunt along the Continental Divide, if I bump any of my mature bucks, almost always they're out of my unit. So even if I hike out and go around, even if it's a 225 incher, I can't go on him because he's out of my unit. That's a pretty, pretty common problem. So no matter where you go to hunt a mule deer, these are the things you want to cover. You want to make sure, you, you know, no matter what, uh, the wind is the wind no matter where you go. And if it's an early season hunt, if you're looking at Nevada, Wyoming, Utah, looking to leave your, your comfort zone, go somewhere else, you got to have food, you got to have water, you got to have cover. This early season high protein woody browse, that's, um, in some areas it's called bitter brush, like in New Mexico, you'll have antelope bitter brush, that's woody browse. But if you get up above timberline, you got the willows, and you got those big, beautiful willow patches. You've seen a lot of the pictures in Colorado and a lot of the videos and stuff. Those big sea of willow patches, those bucks will be out feeding in it. That is such a huge high protein source. Now you have a different food source here in Utah. There's some grasses actually. I talked to the, um, your biologist here last year, and I said, you know, I'm hunting, I'm gonna hunt timberline bucks, but they're not really like Colorado timberline bucks. It's different terrain. And I'd have to, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to tell you the grasses, but even though deer, even like mule deer are browsers, they're still, they will graze on grasses. And some of your grasses that grow up in those Wasatch basins are absolutely phenomenal. Um, typically, you're always going to be in steep terrain, no matter where you go. Okay, so the point of all this is you're looking for good food sources, water and cover, above tree line, out of and away from people. Heavy hunting pressure on public lands, the more remote the better. Seems pretty, seems pretty like basic, but I ran into a lot of bow hunters on the Wasatch, and I, it, it appeared to me they were hunting. You know, they weren't getting to where they were going on the trails of those canyons, they were actually hunting along those canyon trails. I'm like, man, that's gonna be a long hike in and out if, if that's your day of hunting, is, is stalking up some of those hiking trails with all the bikes and runners and things coming up and down them. So if you actually want to have any type of remote success, throw on enough provisions for two or three days and get off those trails and go over to those basins. And that's what I did this year to kill those, that buck. Uh, so the, yeah, the approach is always get above the deer, stay above the deer. That is huge. So many people say, how, you know, if we're going to hunt, where are we going to camp? We're going to camp down here and hike up every day? Absolutely not. It's one of the problems I ran into with the guy I was hunting here in Utah. We got to the back of this canyon, he's like, it's two in the afternoon. The thermals are just blowing up the side of this mountain. He's like, hey, let's go up there. I think there's some big bucks up there. I said, well, if we're going to go up there, we can go up today 
and prepared on tomorrow. It's hunting experience. It's the experience I've had. We can go up tonight if you want, spend the night. We'll hunt those bucks in the morning. And he's like, no, 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 no. Let's go up there right now and shoot one of them big suckers. I said, you're not. Them big suckers know you're here right now. The wind's blowing up this canyon. I mean, they're already gone for today. That's not even, we would approach this completely different. We wouldn't have come to the bottom of the mountain, blowing up straight up into the, the avalanche chute to go hunt those bucks. You want to hunt those bucks that are in that avalanche chute, he may have known they're there every year, and they're there all day long every year. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. But you can't go there right now, my Hanks, right, and walk right up to those bucks and try to go whack them. You want to get up there the night before, day before, bivy out, stay above them, be up there, and then you want to approach them from you in about 10 o'clock. You might want to get up early in daylight, get up there, glass those bucks, find them, let the thermal start rising, let the wind start, you know, kind of get a constant breeze going, a southeast breeze, and get, get your thermals going up the mountain, and then you can approach your stalk. That way you have a constant wind, but you're still going to swirl. And if, you, if you're above bucks and you're looking at them and you've got thermals rising, my advice to you is, don't dilly-dally around. If there's a buck down there you want to shoot, go right at him and either shoot him or don't shoot him because the wind is going to change at some point. I've seen guys, and I used to do it a lot when I first started, I get on a four or five hour stalk. And I've been four or five hours into this thing and when you get 50 yards, the wind's swirling over here and swirling over here and I got away with it. And for four hours I did that. But what you don't think about is for four hours the wind's been doing this all day long and then you get right here. Don't you think it's going to do it right here too? So go right at him. Take your chances. Get a shot. If you don't get a shot, the wind starts to swirl or something, you haven't got your shot yet, back out. Start over. Or you're going to blow them into another unit that you can't hunt or into another basin. So those are very important things that uh, I consider. Um, Trophy class animal, I'm going to cover this real quick. If you want, if your goal, this is the buck that uh, Jason killed in Nevada. 170 class buck. If you want to kill a trophy class buck, and I would consider that a really nice buck, one of the things you can do is when you go to these states, and this is how I first started back in my early days of hunting, I thought I was in the Mecca. You know, I was hunting down there in the Four Corners region, and La Plata County had a ton. You know, and that's where the, uh, over in Dolores County is where the Boone and Crockett typical world record, even today, is still from Dolores County, Colorado. I lived in that country. Well, yeah. But Mr. Burris killed that buck in 1972. And there's still some nice bucks coming out of Dolores County, but La Plata County produces a ton of big bucks. Um, Hinsdale County, Unit 77, produces a lot of great bucks. And those were all units you could kill with one point, you could, or no points. You could draw those tags with no points. La Plata County, Hinsdale County, um, a lot of those southern units. So what I did was I started, and I started taking that same research from my local area into other states. So you get the current Pope and Young books, start looking for trends. You know, every, bu every buck in there is a nice buck. So from 145 typical all the way up to 200 and whatever the new world record is, that Mexico buck, you will look for the state you want to go to and then just look for trends in those counties. And so in the last, if you look, I'll bet you anything, uh, with, with the way these tags are being allotted now in Watson, the Wasatch, what county is that, by the way? Right here, 17A. What's that? Salt Lake County. I just have a feeling in the next edition of the Pope and Young book, when you go to Utah, there's going to be a plethora of entries in that county for the way they've been managing that herd. And all the bucks, you're seeing all these Hoyt guys, team backcountry guys, all these guys that live right here and they hunt that whole thing. Man, I'm just watching their pages all the time and every year. Those guys are just stacking, whacking, and stacking really big bucks out of that county. So watch for that trend. Now and you're all you're going great. You know, y'all live here. You know that. But people like me that live in other areas, they're watching that too. That's how they find their information. Um, so I don't know if that that's helpful to you or not. But if you're going to go look for places because you're looking to kill a trophy buck, that's the first place I would go look. Here's a couple of slides from, I'm going to get into Q&A, and we're just going to talk about whatever you want to talk about. But that was my, uh, that was my Utah buck, and we were my uh, Nevada buck, and we were, what, uh, 11 miles to camp, and then I went in another mile and killed that buck, right? You're like, why in the world would you go 12 miles to shoot that deer? I don't know, man, but every step of the way out hurt, and I loved it, man. I will, I, will, I will go do it again. I would do it again right now, man. I would do it for a lesser buck, probably, just because I love it so much. 
and then there's my crazy horn Utah buck. I saw that thing come out, and I had seen two bucks over 190, and I saw a big 170 class with two big cheaters, and then a buddy of mine, Jaron, sends me a picture. I'm up there in this country hunting, and he sends me a picture. Hey, my buddy killed that buck up there where you're at. And I open up the picture, I'm like, crap, that's the buck I'm looking for right now. I'm looking for this buck right now. I saw him yesterday. I'm trying to kill him, but his buddy snuck in there. I didn't ever see the guy. I'm up there in these mountains, never even see the guy. I get a, I'm looking for this buck, and I get a picture in my phone of the buck dead, and another guy killed him. I was like, well, I was a little deflated. And then this guy in a fork and horn come loping, frolicking <laughs> out of this meadow into the, into the timber. And I looked at him, and I had one day left to hunt. I was like, you know what? If I can't kill a big one, I might as well kill a goofy one. And I shot that one. And I'll tell you what, it's over at Grandpa Paul's right now. It's probably done now. They're getting close. I was like, yeah, I want you to mount that thing for me. Their grandfather, by the way, is a taxidermist. So the whole thing was beautiful. I leave Utah, and I've got a Nevada buck that needs curing. I've got a Utah buck, and Grandpa's. I'm staying at his house. He takes them all in and cures them for me and takes care of the velvet. So it was a beautiful thing. So anyway... Thinking outside of the box today, we're talking about uh, thinking about areas that you could go hunt, ways to find new areas outside of. Do, do all of you, does anybody in here hunt multiple states every year? Yeah. You look really familiar. What's your name? Robbie Day. Yeah, you're the man. I thought so. This guy right here is probably should come give this seminar no, if you want to kill big bucks. So uh, you were in David Long's book too, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, and I remember seeing you from. Uh, I remember seeing you in Eastman stuff way, way back. So yeah, glad to have you in here, man. I hope I, I enjoy it. I hope I haven't embarrassed you. No, 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 so yeah, no, I, I just but um, let's open it up, guys. I want to give some of the stuff away. I said I would cut it off kind of short so we could all talk. And what time is my time frame up? In the back. Do you know what time I'm supposed to be done? At uh, quarter after. Twelve twenty. And what time is it now? Eleven fifty-three. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, right there in the hat. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. How how light are you guys able to get your packs like going in like like your Nevada? Like, we weighed our packs when we left Grandpa's that morning. Where were we all sitting around? I was lighter than you guys. I hate to say that, <laughs> even though you helped me. But I just and I even had my recurve broke down in there. I took it. I packed my recurve and my compound in there because I, I was thinking. But anyway, I think I was around fifty-six pounds. For 12 for because we had planned on staying seven days unless we killed a buck and me and uh what would your pack weigh going in 42 yeah you went pretty light yeah that's what it was he went pretty light that's why he was able to help me pack all my stuff <laughs> but yeah so we're i usually stay in that 45 pound range for a week hunt but i had a bunch of additional gear on this trip just because i had additional gear and uh, I didn't know, really know what to expect. Looking back, I could probably do that trip at about 40, 45 pounds. And you guys, but y'all had video equipment, right? So that's why you were so heavy. I mean, you had batteries and extra cameras and lenses and all that, right? So, yeah. Uh, so here's something cool. I'll give you this right here. I hope, you don't, I hope you're not a Matthews guy and I'm throw the trash. <laughs> hey, right here, sir. As far as managing your scent in the backcountry yep. and keeping clean, keeping your clothes clean, awesome. what tips, tricks, techniques, gear do you use? That, that, one comes, up, that comes up every single year, seminar. Every here's, here's my approach. Here's what I do. Okay, I have designated sleeping clothes. I have, uh, so now I'm a Badland. I was with Sitka for a long time. I've tried different brands, but I use uh, Badland's gear right now. So. Their, whatever they call their first layer, their, their core pants, and the core shirt, and clean socks, and clean underwear. Okay, that's one of the reason my pack was so heavy, is I've got to have fresh drawers and socks every day. I just don't feel myself if I don't. And, I, and people are like, you didn't carry that many underwear? Yep, I'm doing it. Because I, I'm just, I, I, that's just me. I'm going to be clean, as clean as I can be every single day. So what I have is I have a pair of socks, the core pants, and shirt and a beanie that I keep in my sleeping bag. It never leaves the sleeping bag. So when I come in at night, I'll stand in the tent, I get completely naked, and I grab those scent-free wipes, not, and none that have any of the scent blocking material, none of that stuff. I get the ones at Walmart, and they're called, they're called Coleman Personal Wipes. 
They're like two dollars ninety nine cents, and you, they're biodegradable, right? And they have no scent. Because here's the thing: scent free stuff is awesome, but if it leaves a film, bacteria grows off that film, and you're gonna stink. So today I'm scent free. Tomorrow I stink twice as bad. Now I'm scent free, and the next day. I'm three times as bad because that funk is still there, right? So I learned a long time ago I don't use any of that uh, scent blocking stuff. I love it when I'm white tail hunting in Kansas. I have a suit, a carbon suit and sprays. I use all that stuff. And I've shot a lot of Pope and Young whitetails downwind from a tree. But I'm talking, I'm living on the ground, drinking out of a creek, eating dried food, and I need to stay as scent free as possible. The things I do is I keep sleeping clothes separate. Every single night I wipe down those biodegradable wipes Every area, I use scent-free deodorant, and I climb into those clean clothes. At least every night, I sleep clean, and when I get out, I'm as clean as I can possibly be, because you know how it is, you're sweating, you're hiking. And, I, and so, I carry those wipes, I carry like two of those packs of wipes. So, if I'm, before I killed this buck right here, I saw him come out of that meadow, and I had to circle around to get on him. I pulled out my wipes, and I wiped everything down as much as I could, and I actually, I knew it was going to stalk across, and I don't know if you guys have this experience, but Utah's loud. All that stuff, those meadows up there in the high country of Utah is loud. And you look at it like, that's so lush and green, you can just slip through there like a, you know, so stealthy. No way. That is some loud stuff to hunt through. So I took my boots off, and I don't like wet socks. And I'm really going to sound like a sissy, right? But I don't want my socks wet. I didn't have any extra wool socks. So I took my boots and my socks off. And so what I did was I used those wipes, but your feet are pretty rancid. They smell like a cat litter box after the third day, right? <laughs> so I took those wipes and I wiped my feet down real good. I wiped down, I face painted the whole thing. And I slipped in pretty close to this buck and killed him. Did I have to do all that? I don't know, but I go back and I look through all of my bucks. Like I'm always studying my past. And if you watch my Muley Slayer page, it's like sometimes I get hung up in the past, but I learn from all the things I've done in the past. And I go through and I look at my equipment every year and I look at the clothes I wore and I look at, and I reminisce about how I killed this buck. And I kind of just single out all of these elements. Like, what was the wind like? And I keep a journal. Like, what was the wind like this day? What was the weather like? How long did I lay there? What did I do? Almost all of my bucks that you see on my pages that I've killed that are nice bucks, I wiped down. I had no shoes on. And that's painful. And I'll tell you what, don't lose your shoes with no boots on. That sucks. I've done that in Utah, too, down south. That was bad. But uh, you, you, you get as clean as you possibly can. So I hope that's a long version of, but that's what I do. I stay as sip free as I possibly can. And I use the wind. What size t shirt you wear? Large. You know what you got? Sure. Okay, sure. <laughs> Wouldn't matter. That's all I got. Yeah, thank you. Next question right here, sir. Um, so. I try to say fairly extended hunt here. Yeah, I like cooler weather. Yeah, sure. I always seem to have more success in the, in the extended, but you know, as soon as the season opens in the, in the early season, I'm, I'm out there. And I hike in as far as I can because I know that's where I'm going to have success, but my biggest worry is always how far can I go because it's still so hot and get my meat out without worrying about it. And I see you doing 11 miles. Do you, you ever I worry about that? Man, I, you know, and no. And I can tell you that I've not lost very much meat in my career. When I have, um, the meat that I've lost has been portions, and I still try to salvage as much as I can, but I've shot animals right at dark that led to a lengthy trailing job the next day that, yeah, you get a little bone sour that time of year. It's just a risk. That's why I've gotten less and less, and all it took was for me to lose a significant amount of backstrap because of the way a deer laid for me to stop taking less than absolute, I know for a fact I can make it shots. Some, it's an arrow, man. If you shoot an arrow and a buck wheels and turns, I have shot bucks in the antler. I mean, I had them perfect dead to right. They drop spun, and I a beaming hunter sticking right out of a 180 inch buck's antler running off. I'm like, I have wraps with my name on it, man. <laughs> Somebody's gonna go, hey, thanks, Muley Slayer. They're gonna get this shit with Muley Slayer. And go, ah, bonehead, what's he doing? Truly a bonehead, but I've done that. Bucks drop and spin, and they turn toward the sound when you shoot. I don't care if it's a mule deer, whitetail, any big game animal. So I've done that, and, I, and I've made bad shots. And over the years, it's only been a couple, but because of bad shots, because of circumstances out of my control, I didn't find them until too late. But let's just say, perfect scenario, shoot a buck in the lungs, he runs over and dies. Within an hour, I want all my photos, and you're gonna take photos, man, that's what we do. You're gonna prop them up, make the best photos you can, because you want those memories to last you forever. But I would say, that time of year, bone it out too. Don't just quarter it. 
even if you're up on the front on a, on a Saturday and you're two miles up the trail and you shoot a buck in August, it's worth it to stop right there and just lay that buck out and, and bone it. And, and another tip to add to that real quick, I've had in my seminars here before, is I carry that um, clear uh, neoprene um, painter's cloth. It weighs nothing, right? And it's gonna roll about this big around, about that long. And when I kill a buck, and I got him gutted, laying there, because I do the boneless you know, method anyway, um, I lay that plastic out, put rocks on the edges, because it, it, me, it, that's why you're hunting, man. I mean, I don't care. We can get into debates over trophy, not trophy, all that, but you really should make your meat the number one priority once you take its life. Once the instant that animal's dead, the number one priority should be every ounce of that meat should be taken care of like that was the most prized possession, right? So you get that plastic laid out, and then when you're quartering it, you put it on there because I've taken meat to processors before. I process a lot of my own meat now, but I've taken it to processors in the past, and I get a grocery sack back full of meat, and I'm like, man, it really kind of ticks me off because I hike that a long way, <laughs> you know? And I put a lot of work into that. You give me a grocery sack of meat back? Why? Well, there was dirt on it. Fine, there won't be an ounce of dirt on my next meat, I promise you that. And so I take and I lay that plastic out, and it takes really good care of it, and uh, that works out really good for me. So that's the way I do it, but yeah, I bone it out immediately. Clear in the back in a red hat. Sure. Yeah. Well, I use Google Earth as exact. The question is, how do I use technology for basically for scouting, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I use Google Earth, and I can tell you that all of the all of this stuff here, all of that, and every bit of this, I have pins on all of this stuff on my Google Earth. I knew exactly what to expect when I got to Utah. I pinned all these valleys. And I pinned all these peaks, and I did a lot. You know, I used the graphing and the lines and all that, so I know what my my my. Because I'm I'm going to this area. I've never been there before, so I want to know what I'm in for. Because it looks good on paper. Have any of you ever been on one of those hunts where you looked at a map, a topo map, and you said, "I'm just going to go do it." And your best plan, and you get there, and you just just stand and looking at it, going, "No way, man. There's no way." I kind of felt like that a little bit in Nevada. No way, man. You guys are out of your cotton picking mine. I'm not going up that thing. So I've done that in the past. And what I decided to do was I pin the valley floors, I pin the tops, and I draw a line. And I look at how much vertical gain I have. And I mapped it all out. And that's what I did with Nevada. So I take and I pull up an area that I want to hunt. And, and two, I love these guys. They're like my brothers now. But I never hunted with them. And I, you know, being two miles up in the Wasatch, having a bad experience and saying, hey, I'm going to leave, is a lot different than being 11 miles back in a deep wilderness area in Nevada and going, it just don't, didn't work out, guys. i got to go. Number one, I'm riding with you. Number two, that's a long way to go if we're not getting along or whatever. So I looked at all that country, and so what I started to do was I looked for water sources. I looked for food sources. And I looked, what another thing I do when I go to Google Earth, people have pictures, hikers, a lot of the granola guys, man. You know, us hunters, we won't ever get a peak. No way. We won't get a mountain peak in our pictures with a dead buck, right? That gives up your spot quicker than anything. But man, the granolas will. And they'll just take pictures of all this kind of, oh, no, panoramic view, you know? And so what I'll do is I go look at their pictures. And I pull up their, I pull up the terrain and I zoom right in on the picture. And I go and I Google, I go to Google and I just start pulling up Nevada, uh, certain mountain ranges, grasses, uh, Forbes. And I start looking at brows. So I identify what, I already know what a mule deer's food source is. So what I do is I look at their pictures and I identify what pictures I saw in the granola's pictures compared to what the internet says their food source is. And I remember that. And I actually save those, I'll do a screenshot, save it on my phone. And I did it in Nevada. These guys don't even know any of this stuff, right? Because I'm not by myself. But I'll see a plant and I'll stop and pluck it and pull my phone up and I'll scroll through. Oh, that's a so-and-so, so-and-so. That's I know that's mule deer food here. And sure enough, if that's mule deer food here tonight, I'm going to get up here in glass. Sure enough, man, bucks fed right in that stuff. It was a very rewarding feeling to see it. I found a plant that I thought was a food source that I found on Google Earth. It almost seems like you set me up with this, man, but that was a pretty good answer, wouldn't you say? 
I mean, that's pretty awesome. He should give you something. For, for me, that's pretty cool. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to give you, a, I know you, so I'm going to give you a Billy Slayer shirt afterwards. I'm not going to give you a, you're, are you a white guy? No. I didn't think so. You're a prime guy. Now I'm going to give you a Billy Slayer shirt. So, anyway, that prompt any other questions? Yeah, right here, sir, in the glasses. Okay, quick question. Um, you're obviously, do you change your hunting strategy based upon the time of the day? Yes, sir. What the deer are doing? Yes, sir. Can you give me an example of why we do kind of different technique in the morning versus the afternoon? Sure, absolutely. So, I'm going to an area that obviously I know there's deer in. I, I know I'm going to go look for deer here, and I already said I'm going to get above them. I'm going to hike in above the deer. I'm going to stay above the deer. And so if I get up and I glass in a basin, and a lot of times, you know, the bucks are in this general area, but they're not on this side of the, they're not here where I'm at. So I'm glass, I'm looking, and I say I don't find a buck above me, or right below me here, but across the basin, there's some great bucks. I'm going to get over to them. I'm going to stay out of sight. You know, a lot of people say, well, just, you know, it doesn't matter, but I'm kind of like a, I'm a stealthy guy. I, if, if I'm in here, I don't want anything in the basin to know I'm here, ever. I'm never going to give up my location, so I'm not ever going to skyline myself and walk all the way around. Less th it's out of sight, out of mind, right? So I'm going to stay below the lip, but above the level of the deer. I'm going to get over, and I'm going to set up on them, and I'm just going to watch and see what they do. I'll spend a lot of time watching the deer. You know, I've said before many times, and elk hunters hate when I say this, but elk hunting is like checkers, mule deer hunting is like chess, right? Elk, they call them, you make a move, you make a shot, you don't get one, you make another move, and that's how I've killed all the bulls I've killed, was just playing real fast checkers with them. <laughs> boom, 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 a few jumps and I whack him, but I'm not killing Boone and Crockett elk either. I'm shooting Pope and Young class bulls. Mule deer is methodical. I'll sit and watch that buck, and I want so bad to go stalk him. And I'll watch him for two, three days. You know, the Eastman family is huge on that. Mike Eastman, he'll sit and watch a buck for 15 days and come home. Did you ever stalk him? Nah, I just would never write. Man, that, that takes a lot of sand to do that. Me, I'm like, I'm going back to Texas tomorrow. There will be arrows in the sky tonight. It's going to look like 300 up here, man. I'm going to be shooting. But I, I will watch those bucks. And if you watch them in their feeding pattern in those high country basins, you'll see them come out quite a bit in the same areas, bed in the same patches, and I've killed a few bucks by saying, okay, I've watched you do that two or three days now, this is day five, I know where I'm gonna be tonight. And then there's been times in 2010, I killed a 163 inch buck, I was moving from one area to the other because I knew there were bucks in the vicinity, I took a nap, I woke up, took two, three steps, rocks, busted a buck right now, and I shot him. Got him. I mean, I, that was the strategy was if I saw him, I shot him. But I knew I was in that area, and I was up there just basically living like a big old buck. I'm just going to stay in the shade, and I'm just going to stay over here because I couldn't see that area from anywhere else. I had to be right on top of it, but I didn't want to get down in the bedding areas. So I was just going to move from rock pile to rock pile at different times of the day, and if I found them, make a move. Well, I actually, I actually bumped two bucks, one stopped long enough just to see what was going on, and, uh, I had the wind right, and I was in great camo for where I was at. He never saw me, and I shot him. So that's one way, okay? I'm going to make my move according to what the deer do, but I typically never stalk before 10 a.m. There's been very few times that I'll sit and watch them because they're just up and down. You know, they're, they've got a room, and they've got to digest food. Uh, so they'll lay down, and they'll graze, and they'll stand up and graze, and they'll lay back down, but about... 10, 30, 11 o'clock, they'll hard bed until the sun gets to cooking on them again about 2 o'clock, 1.30, and they'll move. I have actually killed a buck one time in Colorado because I watched him lay in two beds for three days. I watched him go from this bed to that bed. And on the fourth day, I was sitting in his bed because the wind was right, because he always approached it from below. He'd leave this bed and go up to this bed. I watched him. So I came over, got, I mean, I was sitting in his bed. It was terrible. <laughs> it was awesome, though, man, because the look on his face, man, when he heard that bow go off, he was kind of walking along, man, like, I'm going to go up here like, down. Oh, it was too late. It was a big buck, man. It was really, it was, it was really an epic moment. So, so yeah, that was cool. Hope that answered some of that for you. Can you hand this to that guy? If you don't quite make it, you got it. Oh. <laughs> Front row. So, uh, do you use any other method other than just doing the research yourself as far as applying for state tags? Or do you get involved in like Cabela's tagging system? I don't, I'm, I'm a do-it-yourselfer. 
And that's all the way down to setting my bows up, tuning my bows, building my arrows, cutting up my meat, packing them out, and applying for my tags. I'm a tight wad. <laughs> I'm tight with my money. I see it being a... Uh, I, hunting is what I do. I, I love it. It's my passion. And I just set some time aside to do my own research and network with people that know what they're talking about. But I don't have anything against those resources. One of the best resources are free if you subscribe to Eastman's Hunting Journal and yeah. you get their member yeah. research deal. Yeah. I use that, absolutely. But to, for Hunting Fool and those guys, you know, awesome, straight up good people. But I'm just going to spend my money somewhere else. That's just me because I enjoy the research of it. And there's enough data out there now that I can pick the phone up or private message somebody and say, hey, I'm looking for information. And believe it or not, more people than not are willing to help. They're willing to just to help you with information. So no, direct answer is why. And no, I don't. And now you know why. I'll hook you up a little later. Yes, sir. Uh, what about uh, major storms to move in when you're up in the back? <laughs> How does that change your strategy or you just sit down and wait it out? We got Corey. This is your debut, man. Come here, come tell a story. I'm gonna let Corey tell you a story about bad storms, right? And what we did. Just stand over here close, son. <laughs> tell this guy. Tell him what happened. So day probably two in Nevada. Yeah. Day two, three, and you know, we we're up there, we're miles away from cell phone service. I think you clocked a couple of Facebook posts on the way in. And yeah. <laughs> the last, last nine, ten miles, it was no bueno for yeah. service. So we knew that there were storms coming in, but, you know, five, six, seven days out, we have no clue what to expect. And Dustin just had to go throw a forest gum and pull it out as it starts to rain one morning. And we're at 11,000 feet in a little saddle, you know, peaks on each side. It uh, it let one loose for several hours that night, and it was the worst lightning storm I had ever endured in 33 years of bow hunting and hunting my whole life. And we had put our tents in strategic places on a ridge, not by the highest trees. You want enough cover to keep the wind off your tent, so always try to. I when I was in Colorado a lot, living in bivy sacks. I would put my bivy sack in deer beds in that low juniper stuff, not high enough to get lightning struck, but. It's a flat enough spot for a 250 pound deer to lay in. It's flat enough for me to lay in. You just can't roll very, very much, right? But I wanted to keep the, the wind is what will pelt you out there in the back country, in those high basins. So I would actually sleep in deer and elk beds, preferably deer beds. Elk beds tend to sneak a lot. But I'd sleep in a bivy sack on the ground in a deer bed. We were on a little ridge, saddle ridge, and we had some bigger pines around us, but we had smaller pines that we tucked up underneath and we kind of tied off to them. Just normal, use our tent stakes tied off to them because your question was what do you do for bad weather, how do you prepare for it? We thought we were less likely to get lightning struck where we set up. We had enough small cover, but I can tell you when the fury of that storm hit full bore, I believe all four of us were just holding on to the tents and praying like I had never prayed in my life. And I mean, I can hear moans and groans, <laughs> lightning hitting so close to our tents that I was certain somebody had died. I mean, I was like, it was an awful thing ever. And I'm actually holding onto my tent so it won't blow off the mountain. And when it's over, we all kind of, hey, you okay? <laughs> I'm all right, man, you okay? And I think there were some other things said about their shorts, whatever. <laughs> and so we get out, and I can see all the headlights flickering. So we all get, and we actually got out in the middle of the night and inspected our damage. And my, I was the only one that really sustained any damage I had the lightest weight tent. It was an Easton tent using carbon poles. I wanted to cut the weight. And it was a really good tent, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hack on it. But the design of my tent was able to, the, the, my, I was in a down sleeping bag, because I like down, it's the lightest weight, you know, right? But it, had, it loses all of its insulation qualities once it's wet. So it got wet uh, because that fly flew up from that wind. And my bag, I had about a half inch standing water in that side of my tent. And uh, it was pretty miserable, but I aired it out the next day. So the best thing to do to answer your question directly is don't get on the ridge line. Don't never do that anyway, just so you don't give up your location. Stay below the ridge line. Don't camp underneath any of the biggest trees around, but get in enough small cover to keep the wind off of you. Actually, I was driving towards when the storms hit during the day. How does yeah. that change your, your hunting tactics? When they get back, that front is, you know, an hour, I, I, carry, I carry really good high quality rain gear. 
But if it's, and I'm hunting, so if, it, if bad enough weather comes in and I've got to fully suit up in my rain gear, I'm going to go get in that low density cover somewhere and I'm just going to hunker down and stay down. Because if, if I'm hunkered down, the bucks and the bulls are hunkered down too. But man, I have shot a lot of my elk and quite a few mule deer immediately following a big storm. So it makes them a little restless, right? So the buck got up. So let's just say a storm hits at three in the afternoon. That's a good time for a storm to hit. So a buck feeds all morning, he beds down, and he's, he, so about three o'clock he's getting antsy. He wants to get up, move location, digest a little bit, maybe go get a drink or something. Well, a bad storm blows in. Say a bad storm blows in and it rains hard for an hour, hour and a half. Man, be ready. Be up and glass and immediately following that rainstorm because just like you, they're nervous, they didn't like it, you don't like it, you want to get up and kind of shake off and move around a little bit, but almost immediately following big high country storms, you can always bet, just like fishing. Man, as soon as it stops, it's going to be good. A lot of times it's good. There you go. Thank you for the question. Am I out of time? It's 17, do I stop at 20? Okay. Okay. All right. So, if, if you didn't get anything, um, you got some questions, make sure you fill out those, those uh, I'll come back and pick those tickets up for the free Badlands pack. From 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, I'm going to be in the Hoyt booth. I hope you got something out of this today. I hope it was worth your time to sit here. If not, hit me up on Newly Slayer and send me a private message and tell me, you know, what you think of the seminar. But if you liked it, tell a friend I'm going to do it again tomorrow. So thank you guys all for coming out.